I will just, yeah. So hello everyone. Welcome back to the Augmented Intelligence Workshop. Uh, it, I'm very excited to introduce two speakers, our two speakers for today's meeting. It's Phil Menzer, who's going to be talking about malicious coordination to manipulate social media, and Ulrike Hahn, who's going to be talking about building better networks. So uh, please, as usual, uh, feel free to type any chat, uh, any comments or questions in the chat, and we'll have a general discussion after two talks, uh, as as usual. Great. Phil, please take us away. Thank you so much. Good morning, everybody. Uh, let me start by sharing my screen. Hopefully, you can see it. So <clears throat> this is going to be perhaps a little bit different uh, in that uh, I'm not going to talk so much about the cognitive aspects of cooperation, but I'm going to talk about uh, coordination among bad actors who are trying to do bad stuff, and mostly uh, based on what we can observe online. So we're talking about malicious coordination to manipulate social media, and this coordination can happen among humans, but also among uh, bots or among automated uh, accounts. And the interesting thing about the online environment is that you don't know who's behind an account. And sometimes it's a human, sometimes it's a program. Usually, often it is a program controlled very closely by a human um, who can manipulate the space by running many, uh, many accounts. And so it's very hard to tell the difference. So let me uh, set the stage by uh, showing the typical object that we study in our lab at the Observatory on Social Media at Indiana University. We study diffusion networks. So in these networks, a node represents a social media user, for example, a Twitter user, and a link between two nodes represents a piece of information that is being shared from one person to another. For example, through a reshare, a retweet, or sometimes it could be an interaction like a mention or a reply. So this particular network is the diffusion network for this particular piece of fake news that you see on the left. This was one of the most popular uh, fake news articles during the 2016 election. It was from a well-known conspiracy theorist, uh, Alex Jones and his website Infowars. Uh, the claim, it was kind of a precursor of what later became uh, even more uh, dangerous, known as QAnon uh, conspiracy theories. Um, here, uh, by the way, the bigger nodes are the ones that are, are more influential. They get more retweets. And the color represents the likelihood that an account is automated um, or, or a bot. Uh, I'll tell you more about this later. So you can see here that there is a bunch of uh, kind of reddish, largish accounts. Those are accounts that are probably all controlled by one uh, by one entity, uh, that entity would be most likely Alex Jones, who control all of these fake accounts. So basically, when he posts this article, then he has all these other accounts retweeted. And that's how many humans who are shown here in blue are exposed uh, to this particular article. And that's how this particular article became so viral. So we are interested in virality. And um, from a statistical point of view, you can ask, you know, what is the distribution of virality? What is the likelihood that a post has a certain number of viewers or retweet, retweets, for example? So this is the distribution of the number of tweets for uh, false claims uh, or uh, fact-checking uh, articles. You can see that the two distributions are similar and they're very broad. They have this long tail, which means that most articles are not very popular, but a few of them uh, are, that's the tail of the distribution, like this particular article was reshared more than 30,000 times, so it's the tail of the distribution. So one question is, how does it happen that a lot of bad content, harmful content, such as misinformation, spread virally? And what are the mechanisms under it? And in particular today, I'll focus on mechanisms that leverage coordination. So one of the way that we address this question is by building agent-based models. We try to build very, very simplified toy models that incorporate some interesting characteristics of the system that we're studying. For example, on Twitter, we might have users who have followers and friends and who have a feed uh, of things that they see, and they have some likelihood that they will see one more thing after another, which depends on how much attention, how much time they spend online. 
if we're trying to measure attention, we might have a parameter that describes how likely it is that they have longer versus shorter uh, scrolling sessions. And their feed is composed of things that their friends post. They're posted by their friends. So, and they can reshare these things or they can post new things. Um, so uh, using this kind of models, um, we found a couple of interesting things, a couple of important ingredients that are, that are sufficient to explain these broad distribution of distributions of virality that I showed you earlier. One of these ingredients is the structure of the social network. We know that real social networks have hubs, they have communities with high clustering coefficient. Uh, we have dense communities separated from each other. We all, and, 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 and it turns out that's important. If you, if you run a model like this on a network that doesn't have those features, for example, a random graph, you don't get uh, the broad distribution of popularity observed in the empirical data. Another important ingredient is the fact that these agents have limited attention. They don't see everything that is posted by everybody else be before deciding what to reshare. Um, and again, in the model, if you assume that everybody look looks at everything, you don't have this broad distribution. But if you say that uh, more likely people only see a few things from their feed and then reach choose to reshare some of them, um, then you do have this um, these broad distribution. So these two ingredients, the structure of the network and limited attention are important in understanding virality. They're not the only ones, but they are sufficient to, um, to at least generate this very, very basic pattern. <laughs> and uh, it turns out that they can be hacked. Okay, so bad actors can actually hack the network to create a structure that more likely favors the spread of the content that they generate. They can also hack attention. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk about how through coordinated accounts through bots. And, and finally, I'll mention very briefly some, some of the work that we do to detect these kinds of coordinated uh, networks. So let me talk about the, how to hack the social network first. Um, Many of you have, have, of course, all of you have heard about echo chambers. Um, when we look at the structure, whether it is the follower network on Twitter or who reshares whom, we find these very, especially in the, in, the, uh, in the context of politics, as in these cases here, we find this very clear polarization where on one side you have liberal people who are retweeting or following other uh, cons liberal people and on the other side you have conservatives who are retweeting and following other conservatives. This has been a very robust finding for more than 10 years now. So how does that happen? What are the, what are the mechanisms that lead to this polarization? And I'll, I'll tell you in a moment that actually then that polarization itself can be manipulated. So again, we, we can use these very simple models um, and uh, inspired, for example, by opinion dynamics models that many of you are familiar with. So we built one where we have a system like the one that I showed you before. Again, uh, nodes are accounts, they have uh, feeds, they see what is posted by their friends. And here we assume that each message is a reflection of one's own political le uh, leaning, which we model very, very simply as the one dimensional variable between progressive and conservative, which is here represented by the color. So we start from a random network, we start from a uniform distribution of opinions and people can be influenced. These are the two key ingredients that you, if you are exposed to somebody's opinion, you can change your opinion a little bit. If it's close enough to yours, uh, it's a bounded confidence model. The other one important ingredient here is that if, if somebody posts something that you strongly disagree with, you can unfriend them which is shown by the dashed lines here. You can decide, okay, I don't, this person offends me. And in this model, we replace that link with a completely random link. And as the model runs, you observe two things happening. First, the opinions themselves are becoming more narrow. Uh, from this initial uniform distribution, we end up with a group of mostly red opinions, a group of mostly blue opinions, and there is less diversity. And the second point is that the structure of the network itself is changing. The agents are sorting themselves out into these clusters, these homogeneous clusters. So we have both emergence of polarization. The opinions are polarized around these two ideas and also segregation. Each agent is only exposed, mostly exposed to opinions that reflect their own, which leverages our own confirmation bias and other cognitive biases. So unfortunately, these two ingredients, social influence and unfriending, 
are basic things that exist because of our cognitive biases and because of the basic mechanisms of all social media platforms. And so this helps us understand why it's very natural, it's not surprising, in fact, it is expected that we, we live in echo chambers to, to some extent, no matter which social media platform we use. And you can run this multiple times, there's different parameters, you can play with the model, but in general, um, uh, under a broad range of, of parameters, a very simple model like this with just these two ingredients shows that we end up in these polarized and segregated groups. Now, why does that matter from the point of view of information diffusion? Well, uh, there are two general classes of models to understand information diffusion. Uh, simple to understand diffusion in general. Simple contagion is what you usually um, captures the spread of diseases where every time you come in contact with an infected individual, you have some probability of becoming infected. Like if I shake your hand or sneeze near you, I might pass COVID to you. Um, and if it happens again, the probability is the same. This is called simple contagion. But uh, a mounting body of evidence shows that when we're talking about spreading ideas or information or behaviors, there is a more complex contagion process. And that means that the more times I'm exposed to this behavior or idea, the, the greater the probability that I will adopt it or reshare it. So the second time, the probability is a little bit higher than the first time. And communities play a key role in this. Why? Because if you have a, a dense community, you have lots of triangles, a high clustering coefficient. And so what happens is that even if there is a single reshare, now, all of the neighbors of one of, of the persons who had posted that piece of information are, many of them are also neighbors of the second one because we have all these triangles. And so a single reach, reshare creates many exposures, many multiple exposures. So many people by one single action, many actors will be exposed now to two instead of one uh, you know, views of this opinion. And so there is a multiplicating factor inside a clustered, a highly clustered community with lots of triangles, just a few retweets very easily generate a, a very large cascade inside the community. The second point that because these communities tend to be homogeneous, as we have seen, people have the same, uh, people in the same community are more likely because of confirmation bias, for example, to adopt an opinion shared by somebody else in that community because they already, they already kind of agree. And so these two ingredients, the multiple exposures, the social reinforcement and the homophily together mean that in a dense community, stuff spreads much, much faster. And that is exactly what we observe in the empirical world. So how can you hack that? Well, uh, one way that we uh, found recently is, uh, and this happens uh, a lot uh, right now, uh, is, is follow trains. Follow trains started as an innocuous thing where on Friday, somebody might say, hey, oh, sorry, it's Friday, follow my friends. Um, but uh, it, it has been weaponized by, at, at least um, uh, we have uh, studied this both on the conservative and on the liberal side here in the US uh, in, in, by accounts that systematically, automatically, many, many, many times a day post nothing other than very long lists of accounts. And they say, everybody follow these accounts. Uh, and um, basically all of the followers of that account or many of them will automatically follow everybody that appears in these trains that is mentioned in these trains. And why would people do that? Well, first of all, let me show you the result. The result is that if you sort of crawl this mentioned network, you find very dense, very hierarchical, hierarchically structured network, where at the core you have very, very high influence nodes. There are these accounts that post these trains. We call them conductors. And then these conductors have many followers that have been mentioned uh, in these trains. We call them passengers uh, or riders. Uh, so uh, the structure of this network is, is a, a highly hom homophilic. So th there is, there is a, the very strong kind of echo chamber structure. So for example, 
if you look at a random edge of a conductor with 50% chance, it links to another conductor. So the conductors that are in the core of the network is very, very, very dense. And then outside of that, we have the riders that are still very, very highly likely to follow conductors rather than anyone else. And then even other political accounts, this, this particular network is the pro-Trump network, the conservative one. Um, but even, even other political accounts that don't play this, uh, this game do not end up in such a strong, uh, strongly concentrated echo chamber. So this has the effect of creating this very large echo chamber where a lot of accounts have huge numbers of followers. So it is very, very highly dense. And the name of the game is to increase your followers by following other people who will then reciprocate. Why is there this kind of collusion? Because Twitter puts a limit on the number of accounts that you can follow. You can follow at most 5,000 people unless you have more than 5,000 followers. So if I have 5,001 followers, now I can have 5,001 friends. I can follow one more person. So if you and I agree, I'll follow you, you follow me back, we can both gain one extra follower. And the more followers you have, the more likely it is that you have influence, that uh, your ideas will be uh, shared. And we know that in these political echo chambers, you have a lot of low credibility information that spreads both on the right and on the left, although it's not symmetric. So that's why you see that the ratio between the number of followers and friends is very highly peaked around one. That's by design, because these accounts constantly get more people to follow and then they can be followed back. And we find that uh, the, both the conductors and the writers um, have uh, uh, acquire followers at a higher rate than other political accounts, especially the conductors. Uh, they can gain hundreds of followers every day. And in fact, if you look at the number, the average number of new followers that an account receives before and after being mentioned in one of these trains, we observe a big spike. Um, and the median of the spike is a 600% increase in the number of followers right after the, in the day after they are mentioned in a, in a train. So this is a way for to have a loose kind of collaboration or, or coordination or collusion among accounts to hack the network. This way you get a bigger, denser echo chamber and inside that echo chamber, everything spreads super fast because everybody retweets everybody else. We also observed this by launching some bots ourselves. These are neutral bots that don't uh, that do completely random actions. Um, we, we, we launched 15 of them. Uh, they, they all do the same things, which is completely random things, following random people, following back random people, posting random sentences and so on. But the difference between these is that they are in five groups of three and each group starts by following one account, which is a new source. Uh, and they are divided into five groups. Um, in one group, they start following a left-leaning source. Another group, they start following a right-leaning source and, and so on. And so we observe that usually uh, these accounts find themselves in these homogeneous dense echo chambers. And usually wherever they start has a big effect on where they end up. There are a few exceptions, like here's one that started following the Wall Street Journal. And then at some point it started following CNN and it veered to the left and it found itself in a left-leaning uh, echo chamber. But in the majority of cases, if you start following a right-wing site, you end up in a right-wing echo chamber. And if you start on a left, uh, following left-leaning news source, you end up uh, finding yourself in a left-leaning uh, echo chamber. And uh, here, uh, the yellow nodes are the bots. And you can see they're a portion of their ego uh, networks. And so the networks of their friends and followers. The size of the color represents political opinion and the size represents the fraction of things that an account posts from low credibility sources. So the big nodes are spreaders of misinformation. So you can see that the accounts that are on the conservative side here are exposed to more uh, low credibility information. As I said before, it's not quite symmetric. In fact, both on the right and on the left, we see a high transitivity, which is the measure of clustering coefficient, which is basically a way to count triangles. 
So both the bots that start on the right and the bots that start on the left find themselves in denser groups with more triangles than the bots that start in the center, because this game of building these, these echo chambers happens among partisan accounts. But like I said, it's not symmetric in terms of the misinformation that are shared in these uh, uh, political echo chambers. There is much more of that on the right than on the left. Okay, so that's a little bit about how to hack the network. So how do, to hack attention? Uh, so there's different ingredients. One is the algorithm, okay? So the social, the, the ranking algorithms we know pay attention to engagement, right? If more people are sharing something, then they're more likely to show it in your feed. So we, we use one of these models to look at what happens as the algorithm is tuned to give more or less weight to engagement, okay? So let's imagine that the algorithm has some measure of the quality of a piece of information and uh, with some probability, which is depicted here on the x-axis, they will uh, rank things based on how popular they are, how, how many people have already shared it. And with one minus that, they instead rank it based on the assessed quality. And what we see in general is that, uh, and on the, on the, on the z-axis here, there is the average quality of information spreading in the network. And in general, what happens is that the more the algorithm is biased by engagement or by popularity, the lower the average quality of information in the system. There is a little exception here for a narrow range of attention by the agents. A small amount of, of popularity bias or engagement bias can give a little boost in quality. This is the effect of, of the wisdom of the crowds. You can detect quickly something that is good because many people are sharing it. But generally speaking, this engagement bias, all it does is just amplify noise. And that's why we see that uh, it actually is harmful. So if you can create the appearance of popularity, if you can create the appearance that many people are sharing something, you can trick the algorithm and then the algorithm will start amplifying your stuff. So that's one way in which you can manipulate the system. The second one, you can manipulate users themselves. If you tell people, look, a lot of people have shared this, they're more likely to share it. So to test this hypothesis, we developed a game uh, called Fakey, which simulates a social media feed with current news. Uh, anybody can play with this. It's an app, you can, it, it runs on your browser or on your, or your mobile phone. And the experiment here is that we have, a, we have a number. We tell people how many others have already liked or shared a piece of news. And this piece of news can come from a mainstream source or from a low credibility source. And these are real articles. And then people have to decide whether to share it or like it or maybe flag it for fact checking. And what we find is that if you look at low credibility articles, the more people think that they have been shared by other people, the more they're likely to share, they share it or like it, even though they're from low credibility sources. And conversely, the less likely they are to flag it for fact checking. So just being exposed to knowledge about how popular something is, pushes people to be more, makes people vulnerable. And so this is also, so when you hack, when you create the appearance that many people are sharing something, you can trick the algorithm and people at the same time. So you have this vicious cycle. You trick people, more of them share it, the algorithm picks up the signal, and then more people see it. And vice versa, you trick the algorithm, the algorithm thinks people are sharing it, they show it to more people, and then more people share it, and then that tricks the algorithm again. So you can kill two birds with a stone. And how do you do that? Well, you can do that by creating fake accounts. We, we, we started observing some of these fake accounts, we call them social bots, uh, more than 10 years ago. Uh, on the left, we have two accounts that are just retweeting each other many, 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 many times. The blue is this really fat edge. Our, our algorithm depicted edges between nodes uh, proportional to the number of retweets. And we thought it was a bug in our code, but no, it was because these two accounts were retweeting each other tens of thousands of times. So obviously that was, th those were controlled by the same agent. They were actually trying to promote this account on the left, which is a politician. And on the right, we have a bunch of fake accounts uh, we investigated. They were all run by one person. They were fake church accounts, and they were all tweeting links to a fake news website run by the same person. Um, and so they would post links to these fake news articles, uh, and they would mention one person, which was a target. This was uh, 
a regular person like a journalist or a politician in the hope that that person would then retweet uh, this fake news and, and, and help it spread virally. So in this case, this is an example of a bunch of fake accounts that are collaborating together. They're not independently collaborating. They're really run by the same person. But you cannot see that. You all see all you can see is these accounts and and realize, okay, it's surprising that they would be so highly coordinated. Well, in reality, it's because it's really one single uh, person behind it. Uh, so we find lots of examples of these. We build a tool called bot, we're building a tool called Bot Slayer um, that was used in this particular case to notice all these red dots here, these red nodes. These are Russian fake uh, Russian uh, uh, accounts, bots that were promoting a fake video attacking a particular target, Bill Browder, for those of you who have heard about him. And uh, in this particular case, this network of bots was very quickly, within minutes, uh, found by Twitter, and all of these accounts were immediately suspended. But before that happened, we noticed we, it was very interesting to see them pop up on the screen and, and see a real uh, live example of a coordinated network of, of fake accounts pushing some junk. Uh, here's another example that comes from deleted uh, uh, tweets. We, we investigated uh, accounts that delete very large number of tweets every day, like thousands. And in doing so, they can circumvent uh, Twitter's limit of posting at most 2,400 tweets per day. They can post even tens of thousands of, of tweets because then they delete them. They post and delete, post and delete. And one of the things that we noticed is that some accounts were posting stuff. And then before they deleted it, a bunch of other accounts were liking it and unliking it, liking it and unliking it hundreds of times. Uh, so we had to investigate this. And it turns out that obviously all these accounts are coordinated. So the nodes in the center is the account that posts uh, the, 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 the tweet. And then all of the red accounts around it are the ones who are liking it multiple times liking it and unliking it. And then at the end, the original account deletes it. So in the meanwhile, they, they are, they are, they're manipulating the algorithm, right? Because uh, the platforms thinks, oh, a lot of people are liking this. And they may push that particular piece of information to go trending or in any case to be uh, spread more widely. And then later on, the, the content is removed. So there is no trace of this uh, inauthentic activity. And so that's how these accounts can survive uh, a long time. And uh, some of them sell stuff. They sell fake, uh, fake followers, fake accounts, uh, merchandise, retweets. They do all sorts of stuff that is actually forbidden on the platform. So this is another type of, of collusion. Uh, and we also use our models to try to quantify how a bunch of coordinated accounts, whether they are automated or not, can infiltrate a community and then in some sense control that community by lower the quality of information in the community. Here, the yellow accounts are the coordinated bad actors and uh, the, the, the gray accounts are the humans <coughs> and darker gray or black means that they're sharing more misinformation. And the yellow accounts are just sharing low credibility or bad content. And you see that when they are kind of peripheral to the network, uh, they have a limited effect on the quality of information in the system. But when they actually can infiltrate the network and having many humans follow them, then they can drive the quality down. And there is a nice, there is an interesting transition. This is still work in progress, but it looks like, you know, when, if you can get enough people to follow you above a certain threshold, then you can basically drive, uh, completely control the community. All right. Uh, how much time do I have? Am I already over time? Am I okay? Yeah, a couple of minutes. Uh, okay, so I will, okay, I will go very fast. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, so just to say that these coordinated accounts are hard to detect because you look at one and it looks perfectly fine, but then you notice that it's similar to many others. So in order to detect this, you have to look at lots and lots of um, uh, pairs of accounts. So we have a framework that tries to do this, building a network based on some measures of similarity. And doing that, we found lots and lots of instances of all kinds of different manipulation in different domains, political health, um, uh, protests, uh, or also uh, fraud, and, and so on and so forth, including uh, the spread of COVID uh, misinformation uh, not only on Twitter, but also on Facebook. Okay, so 
that's it. Uh, so to summarize, Malaysian coordinated, uh, coordination on social media can be used to inflate followers, grow parties and echo chambers, exploiting complex contagion and spreading misinformation. And uh, it can trick, uh, you, it, it can be used to infiltrate communities, flood the network with bad content and manipulate attention for people and algorithms. And so we need we need work to detect these. Uh, we're beginning, but there is there is there is a lot of work uh, to do because it's a it's technically challenging problem. Uh, thank you. I'll stop there. This is my team. I should say that this is really work of many many people, my wonderful students and and uh, colleagues and postdocs. Uh, thank you guys. Thank you very much for presenting this exciting work. Uh, and I think we have a time for maybe one question, if somebody has a question specific to Phil, and then we'll proceed with Ulrika's talk. Let's see. I, I can stop uh, sharing. Rob, yes. Rob, jump in with your question. Um, yeah, so that was a really great stuff, Phil. Super inspiring, super um, important and, and relevant, <laughs> obviously, to the social times. I guess it, you made the point that there were some situations where you would get uh, a wisdom of crowd effects in a very narrow band versus the regular effect, which is just um, amplification of noise. So I'm wondering if you have any ideas about what you would propose to thicken the wisdom of crowd range, what, what could be done infrastructurally? That is a very good question. And there is actually quite a bit of research on recommendation algorithms. The name of the game is yeah, you want to use signals from humans if you can use it to find good stuff. And the naive, the naive notion comes from, you know, even Google, right? Google's fortune has been built on PageRank, which is another, nothing other than an engagement or popularity algorithm, a clever one built on top of the network. And now we realize, okay, it can be gamed. Well, Google realized that a long time ago. And so they have been investing. For, for many, many years on very sophisticated algorithms that try to detect this kind of manipulation. And platforms are probably beginning to do something like that. Unfortunately, we don't know any of that because they don't publish as much as uh, <laughs> Google researchers published 10 years ago or 20 years ago. So uh, I think that there is a lot of work that needs to go into uh, building algorithms that are robust to this kind of coordinated manipulation. It is a very hard, uh, a very hard problem because to look to find coordination, you, it's a quadratic problem, right? You have to look at pairs. Yeah, it's like finding a needle in a haystack because there is a quadratic number of possible links and possible pairs of accounts that could be coordinated. Uh, so there is a signal, like you said, um, to be mined about um, about wisdom of the crowd. Uh, but probably right now, all platforms, as far as we can say, are weighing too much on the engagement and too little on the quality. They do have access to measures of quality. For example, we showed that if you look at the diversity of the audience of a source, that is a very good signal of quality. Um, and that's also kind of a wisdom of the crowd kind of effect. But instead of just looking at the number, you're looking at how diverse they are, which is a little bit less easy to fake, less easy to manipulate. So they could they could look at metrics that try to take into account not just engagement, but other metrics that are more closely correlated with quality. Thanks. Great, thank you very much. And I would invite Ulrike to take the stage and we'll have the time for more general discussion and for further questions for Phil and Ulrike and both of them in the end of all, both talks. Okay, well, uh, this will follow on neatly because I'm actually literally going to talk about exactly this question that uh, Rob just raised and that uh, Phil has already been giving an answer to. So uh, as everybody knows, we've been studying for uh, quite a while now, social influence, uh, it's pervasive. And uh, much of that research has been uh, concerned with trying to understand the dynamics of this. What, what kind of, what happens in social networks over time? How does information get diffused? But we can also ask questions about whether social influence is good or bad. And Phil's talk has got at that uh, 
question sort of implicitly by looking at the spread of misinformation. But we can also ask that question even where all actors are doing the best they can, right? So I'm going to be talking about contexts where there is no misinformation, but we're still interested in effects of quality. And we know there too that there will be differences in quality. We've heard of wisdom of crowd effects where aggregate group judgments can be kind of spookily accurate, but at the same time, there's groupthink and there's herding and there's polarization where views get extreme, but also extremely divergent and both groups can't be right. So uh, that question that poses itself and that I've been thinking about for about 10 years now is, is really when is group influence good or bad? What how do, 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 do groups affect the accuracy of our beliefs? And uh, that question, like I've just said, has been much less studied in these, these, this, this recent explosion of, of work on opinion dynamics. But there is a sort of small niche psychological literature and social psychology that looked at the effects of group deliberations and small groups on collective accuracy, also the accuracy of individual members and so on. But uh, there's an important lesson from that literature, I think, to be learned for anyone wanting to go into this area, which is that 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 literature kind of ended in tears. People did this for kind of a decade, and then it all ended up being incredibly messy. Sometimes you found this, sometimes you found that, and people kind of gave up and got bored with it because there were little clear take home stories. And I think the point that emerged in that literature that was already made cogently by Robin Hogart at the end of the 1970s, is that this has all the hallmarks of something where you need some kind of formal tools, uh, conceptual frameworks to try to make sense of these discrepant results. And I've recently written a, a review for anyone who's interested in topics that kind of goes through the relevant formal frameworks that exist in this area. But um, just to kind of set this out really simply, uh, for anyone who might not have uh, come across this kind of work, what we're interested in is a context where there are a bunch of target values. These could be probabilities, these could be other numbers like the number of jelly beans in the jar or the size of particular people. And then we have raters. And these raters uh, make judgments of these target values. And what we're interested in is how good are they, right? So what we're going to do is we're going to measure the accuracy of these estimates by comparing what raters say with these true values and deriving some kind of score or accuracy measure. But in a collective context, we don't just have one rater, we have, right, we have, we have many raters. So there's two things we could ask in this context. One is that we could do what I just said for each individual rater, right? Compare them with these target values. And then we can take a grand average of those and that will give us a measure of average individual competence, okay? But at the same time, we could also have these raters form a collective judgment. So what we're doing then is we're taking all of the ratings, combining those into a, say a single average or other aggregate, and then we're comparing that judgment, that aggregate with the target values. And that will be our measure of collective competence. Now, in this context, there are a number of uh, interesting mathematical results. One incredibly simple and powerful one is something called the diversity prediction theorem, which tells us that for any sort of set of estimates such as these in a true value, uh, if we measure this collective error as the squared deviation of the, that mean estimate from the truth, and if we think of the diversity of the group as the variance around that mean, then it's mathematically going to be the case that this collective error plus this variance, the group diversity, will give you the average individual error. And you can sort of think about this, right? It makes intuitive sense. There's a mean, there's distribution about the mean, and that gives you the the individuals. Now that, that isn't yet terribly interesting, but actually this is really interesting. If you just rearrange this by subtracting group diversity on both sides, because now you see that the collective error basically is the average individual error minus the group diversity. And that tells us sort of that by mathematical necessity, the collective prediction 
must have accuracy that's at least equal to the average of the individual error. And that's where your wisdom of crowds comes from, right? And the thing that we also see is that variance, which Phil already mentioned, the diversity in the estimates reduces collective error, right? And actually in generating this crowd wisdom, both of these things are equally important, right? This, this equation is not collective error is average individual by one half the diversity, it's by minus the diversity, right? So we now have these kind of three quantities that we can conceptually systematically interrelate. We have the, the collective error, the average individual error, and uh, the variance or the dependence between these kind of estimates. And we, can, we realize that one of these will increase er uh, collective error, uh, accuracy, right? So making people individually more accurate will also boost collective accuracy. Um, but making them less diverse will have the opposite effect. And this is, of course, where communication comes in. Because when we communicate with others, that typically is in a wider structure where I'm communicating not just with Rob, but Rob's also talking to Phil, and I might also be talking to Phil, and that structure matters. But crucially, what we're doing when we're communicating is we're conveying information, which may make us more accurate, but will also create dependence between us, right? So it will reduce variance. So we would expect what I've just said about the diversity prediction theorem, it to be the case that the structure of the network, which determines who communicates with whom and how often, at what rate, to affect the dependence and the individual accuracy. So we would expect to have systematic effects of network structure on collective and individual accuracy. And indeed, there is now a body of research that shows exactly such uh, uh, effects as the there are behavioral experiments. I think the first that I know of is, is a study we did in 2015, but there have been uh, numerous studies of this kind since. I'll just give you a brief flavor of that study. So in this study, you come into the lab, you sit behind a computer, you're connected with a whole bunch of other people in that room, fairly small groups, five to eight people, and you answer questions on screen. And you give an estimate for uh, a bunch of sort of statistical questions about Sweden, whose answers we got from the Swedish uh, national statistics agents, like what proportion of Swedes under the age of 25 drink alcohol, that kind of stuff. You give your answer, you then see answers from some of the other people you're connected to, but you don't know these connections. Uh, you can then revise your answer. You then see other people's revised answers, and that goes over multiple rounds. And unbeknownst to you, we're manipulating the structure of the network. So in particular, we have here, you're either in a small world network, which is a really common topology in the real world, characterized by sort of short paths, or you're in a complete graph where everybody sees everybody. Now, if we look at what happens to the average individual accuracy, this is called validity here now because it's good, not error, so high numbers are good, right? Over rounds, people improve as a function of the communication, and they do so in both the small world network, the red graph, and uh, the blue graph. When we look at the collective competence, here we now see a, a, a significant effect that too improves, but we see that people in the small world network are collectively more accurate. There's a bigger wisdom of the crowd effect than there is in the complete network, even though less information is being exchanged. And that is, of course, because of the dependency that the amount of uh, communication introduces, which decreases the diversity, right? So we have these two opposing forces in action here, which combine to give this collective error. Now we can also look at the same kinds of things in agent-based simulations of the kind that uh, Bill has also just introduced. And we've been working uh, with a model where there is a ground truth, right? I'm interested in accuracy. So there always has to be a way of determining the truth in a simulation. And the agents in this simulation, they talk about a single claim and they can receive on a given trial evidence from the world about this claim. And they can also receive testimony from other agents who they're connected to with certain probability. And when their belief in this claim 
is above a certain threshold, they say, yes, the claim is true. When it's below a certain threshold, they say, no, it's false. And otherwise, they don't say anything. And again, you sort of start with, with particular initial beliefs, and then you look at how this develops over time. And here, too, you see systematic effects of just the network structure on uh, collective error, right? So we have here the, the fully connected network and the small world network that you've just seen, and this replicates the, the, the behavioral pattern you've just seen. But maybe even more interesting is that all of these networks, which I'm not otherwise going to say a lot about, other than that we took these structures from a paper by Rob, um, is that all of these other networks that I've circled here have exactly the same number of nodes and the same number of links. So the total amount of communication is exactly the same. Everything about these agents is the same, except the particular way they're wired up. And of course, given the complex dependency between collective error, individual error, and uh, diversity, right? it's also the case, and shouldn't be surprising to you, that those networks that are best in decreasing individual error right, are not necessarily the ones that are best in decreasing collective error or giving you the best wisdom of the crowd effect. Right? There's these three things that we have to keep track of. So. The mere structure of our social networks changes demonstrably the accuracy of our beliefs, even if we're otherwise exactly the same, right? And even if there's no bad faith actors anywhere, I can, so you've seen evidence from simulations, from behavioral experiments, and there are mathematical results that make this make sense. So why do the, we care about this, right? Well, the reason we care is because we've actually been getting aged for the last 15 years in this massive social experiment where we've completely changed the nature of our human communication networks. And when I started being interested in this, there was a lot of discussion about whether this was going to have any effect. And the dominant view about just 10 years ago was, well, anyone who was worried about social networks was exactly the kind of person who would also been worried about the introduction of the telegram or the radio or, or email, and that this was just a platform. But given what I've told you so far about the role of structure and these, these relationships, Looking back, we sort of think like, what did we think was going to happen when we allowed social media tech companies to fundamentally alter the social structure of our communication networks, right? This was always going to change things and change it in a profound way. So even if online social media did nothing other than massively increase the scale or the topology of our networks, we would expect a significant impact on the accuracy of our individual and collective beliefs, given what I've said so far. But of course, in the real world, the problem is worse, right? Because in fact, these are not just platforms. What Twitter or Facebook or Reddit are, are actually hybrid human AI intelligences for public debate. So we've given over what was the public square to a hybrid human AI intelligence that we don't actually understand. And as Phil already pointed out, and as everyone I think at this point is aware, what's going on here is that these platforms are run with algorithms that promote content, right? So they're dynamically changing these networks. They're, 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 they're raising uh, the prominence of contacts. They're pushing you to connect to new people. And all of this is happening on the basis of algorithms and algorithms that are designed to maximize advertising revenue. So it would be incredibly unlikely, though possible, that this would somehow be exactly the kind of change that we needed to also make our beliefs more accurate. Uh, but that seems kind of unlikely to be the case, given our sort of human experiences over the last years. So the question then I think that poses itself is, well, if we managed to grab control of algorithmic mediation, and we wanted to do this such that we improve the accuracy of our beliefs, as opposed to maximizing engagement and clicks and hence advertising revenue, what would we do, right? What would, could we do to make our beliefs more accurate? Well, we could remove false content. There are countries that have gone down that route. We've had some of that during COVID. We've had it after the US election. It's problematic, right? Who's the arbiter of truth? Most people are fairly uncomfortable about going there. We can do what already happens. We promote higher accuracy commentators, right, and content. 
But this can only ever be part of the problem because of course, much of the discussion that we have is about context where we don't already necessarily know the truth, right? So we don't necessarily know what's going to be higher accuracy content. So the question I'm interested in is what can we do about those kinds of contents? Context, right? Where there isn't yet a ground truth. We're talking, for example, about a future event as we are in the context of COVID. And here I've been working in the last few years uh, with uh, particularly Jason Burton, a former PhD student of mine now at Copenhagen Business School, on the idea of algorithms for dynamically rewiring networks in those contexts where we don't yet know a ground truth. So what we did here is we're always dealing with a situation where we have 16 agents that are placed in a randomly generated network. This is seeded with an initial belief. That's because each of these simulated agents gets uh, 10 pieces of sort of stochastic evidence from the world of varying quality. You can vary the sensitivity or the specificity, the true positive or false positive rate. And then they communicate with one another according to a network structure. They revise their beliefs and they revise their beliefs according to the kind of revision rule that people use in the kind of um, behavioral experiments uh, from Sweden that, that, I, that I outlined to you, right? We've now done a lot of studies like this. People have done a lot of studies. We have a good sense of how people derive their new estimate on the basis of previous estimates. So we can just plug in those kinds of rules. And then after five rounds of uh, communication, we look at uh, the, the, the beliefs in the network and, and we score their accuracy. But the crucial thing is that we're always going to compare now a static network where you just start out in a configuration and over those five time steps, that's all you do. You talk to the same five people that you're connected to and you're propagating beliefs through that network, or we're dynamically rewiring this network potentially at each step. And there's two kind of polar opposites of algorithm that we considered. One we just called the mean extreme algorithm. And you can see examples of this running here and the effects on the belief distribution. This is the mean extreme on the bottom. This is the static network at the top. And in the simulations, we're dealing with probabilities. <laughs> so we simply ask, where's the majority of the opinion? And now we're looking at the people who are furthest away from those. And we're going to give them some links to not just that mean, but to the people who are sort of beyond the mean, the, the sort of caricatures of the mean. And so what that algorithm will do in this context is that it will make beliefs more homogenous and pull these outliers to where everybody else is. The other algorithm, the polarized algorithm, literally does the opposite. It amplifies those people who are furthest away from the mean. The logic of this being, you know, sounds crazy, but given what I told you about the diversity prediction theorem and the importance of variance and it being equally important, there might be benefits to this. And this is what we find in our simulations. So uh, just to unpack this, these are different uh, configurations of in initial uh, quality of evidence, right? You can just think of this as increased initial accuracy going this way and initial increased initial accuracy going down. So these are the least accurate in their initial beliefs and these are the most accurate. And we then show the results for both of these algorithms where what we're plotting is the change relative to the static network that started out exactly the same way. So change that goes up is bad and change that goes down is good. And I'm showing you three different measures, collective error, average individual error, and the variance. And so what you basically see in this graph, right, is that, well, first of all, it depends what knowledge you start with. If you don't know a lot at the beginning, you're, you've got a lot of noise, you're pushing around a lot of noise, you're not going to get huge boosts in accuracy. If everybody already knows what the truth is, more or less, you're also not going to get huge increases in accuracy. But in between, you get stuff happening. And basically, the mean extreme algorithm in these circumstances works very well. Polarize makes things worse. Now, what happens uh, in the context of an experiment, right? This is sort of kind of an existence of proof, makes sense given everything I talked, but what happens with actual people? So we ran a behavioral study 
where people had to make predictions about future events that weren't yet resolved at the time of making these judgments, so we don't know what the ground truth is. You make an estimate, give a reason, you then see other people's estimates, right? And we're literally doing the same thing we did in the simulation uh, over multiple time steps, or so you're either stay seeing the same people or we're rewiring you and giving you other judgments of people on the basis of one or two of these algorithms. And this is what we find. Well, first you find a lot of noise because now you have, in studies like these, which are extremely expensive to do, your groups are participants. So you spend thousands for not having uh, very many participants, but we did find a difference on how much beliefs changed in the three different kinds of conditions within groups. We didn't find groups differences per se, because the problem is always that you don't have that many groups. And so they might start with different initial accuracies, right? So you don't have the same equal starting conditions you have in the simulations. But the, the result really is here. Nevertheless, if we look at change scores, right, that, that factor in how much more accurate or less accurate you did you get, we find that actually here we get the opposite of what we had in our simulations and that now it was this polarized algorithm that improved people uh, and other people uh, got worse. So why is this? Well, the reason this comes about is because of the contrast in the distribution of initial beliefs between what we simulated and what people had in this particular experiment. So these nine things here are just the different quadrants from the previous plot ordered from least accurate to most accurate with respect to the initial distribution of beliefs. And this, if we order the actual people's beliefs in these this, this experimental tax in that particular way, none of these distributions look the same. So how can we proceed in this context, given all of these constraints? Well, one thing we can do is we can try to do simulations, but with real data, as it were. And here, Abdullah Amutuk from uh, MIT has this genius data set now that has 57 uh, data sets of people doing these kinds of estimation tasks, which combines judgments from over 4,000 individuals. So we can rerun simulations of the kind that we did by sampling from those data to have a kind of representative initial belief distribution, and then just rerun the simulation, running using this empirically validated update rule to see what these kind of artificial, but based on real people participants would do. And when we do that, uh, we find uh, an interesting relationship between characteristics of this initial belief distribution and how well these accurate these algorithms work. So in the left-hand plot, just to unpack this for you, is the 57 tasks in a histogram where they're just plotted by the skew of the distribution, the skew in the distribution of the individual beliefs in one of these networks sampled from kind of real data. And on the right-hand side, we show also a histogram as a function of skew, we show how often one of our three algorithms was the best of the three algorithms, right? Because we can simulate these just starting with the same distribution. So again, we have the static, we have blue, the mean extreme and the polarize. And we can see clearly emerging now conditions here where different algorithms do a differently good job on average as a function of the initial skew of the distributions. So we're relating the success of these algorithms to a feature of the distributions that is, is accessible without access to a ground truth, right? We don't have to know what's true or false. We can just look at characteristics of these judgments in and of themselves and use that potentially to select which algorithm here we would choose in order to maximize our chance of boosting uh, the accuracy in this particular deliberating group. So all of this, of course, is merely proof of concept. I, I can't tell you how much network topology and structure actually matters and then say what's going to be the case in a simulated 16 person group is also going to be the case in a social network with uh, billions of nodes. 
obviously to uh, to really make headway with this, we're going to need to be able to study this at scale with real world online social networks. And that's difficult because at the moment, only very special people have access to these real world online uh, social networks. And there's a point where you simply can't for the very facts that I've set out, just do stuff in the lab. You also have to be able to play around with these actual existing structures. But so uh, to uh, wrap up, collective accuracy, individual accuracy, and their interrelationship uh, all matter with respect to uh, the accuracy of our belief. As a result, we'll get competence differences, even just among good faith actors that are solely due to network structure. And we can potentially think about harnessing this to improve accuracy, right? If in a world where we could decouple from advertising revenue, uh, because there are systematic relationships, it seems with the shape of distributions and the impact for different algorithms to boost algorithm to accuracy. But of course, to really understand this, uh, we need to be able to examine these things at scales which means that we really need to be able to do what tech companies uh, do. Uh, so thank you very much for your tendency. Uh, Thanks for listening. And uh, thank you in particular of my collaborators to Jason Burton, whose PhD work, the rewiring stuff was, and who had the kind of bright idea to look at it in this way in the first place. So thanks. Excellent. Thank you very much for presenting this fascinating work. And I see a very uh, interesting question from Rob on um, bias and heterogeneity. If you want to ask it, <laughs> okay. Well, it's a little yeah, it's a little bit technical. But going back to the Scott Page proof, um, I how does that depend upon whether the people's estimates are unbiased or not? Like if this is the ground truth and everybody's estimate was too high then it doesn't seem like you would get any diversity benefit but they, but you couldn't have a mean that but but you would still so so it doesn't depend on things being normally distributed like other things that depend on the central uh, limit theorem so you you can put it you can put a you 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 can put in skewed estimates and it will still it will still do something Okay, so my simulation is like get like this is low diversity and this is high diversity, but they're both, but you don't get any benefit from canceling out. Like as soon as this point goes on the other side of the ground truth, then you get a canceling out benefit. But it's still going to be the case. So even in this case, if you think about it mathematically, it's still going to be the case that the collective estimate, this my middle finger here, right? Hey. Hey. excuse me, is going to be more accurate than the average of these because of the way squared loss works, because these guys uh, are going to really, really pull you down. These guys are going to be bent, but but actually the average of this squared distance is going to be less favorable than that distance. Yeah, or square, if it's a squared deviation yeah. from the truth, that I think that makes sense. Yeah. Great. Uh, I would like to open it up for general discussion. Uh, if anyone has questions for potentially relevant to both Ulrike and Phil's presented work, please uh, either raise your hand or type it in the chat. And I can maybe start with one first uh, general question. So, uh, inspired in particular by Ulrike's talk, but also relevant for Phil's work. So uh, you were mentioning that uh, there is a potential difference between um, wanting to uh, algorithms or solutions that are uh, targeting uh, collective error versus average individual error. And I would want you to maybe uh, talk more about in which cases would we want to focus on the collective error when, for example, maybe if there are two polarized echo chambers, they would still average out into something clo close to the truth, or in which cases would we want to focus on the uh, on optimizing individuals' error of individuals' beliefs? 
Yeah, okay, so, so there's, there's two aspects to this. Um, so one, it might still be that even considered as an optimization problem, that there are uh, networks that are, that are better overall, right? If I look sort of jointly across these two things, we're still doing um, a research in that area. I so just want to make the, the simple point that just because it's doing one thing, it's not going to do uh, the other thing, but we might still be able to find network structures that at least in certain consider configurations, it's going to depend again, presumably on the distribution of, of, of beliefs and the act and, and the accuracy of those where one, where, where one size in that context might fit all. But um, the one context where uh, you might care about collective accuracy, and I actually, we have a paper on this in 2019 in topics, and I actually had some slides on this, but in the interest of time, I took it out, is voting. Right. So if you think about voting, voting isn't something like the US elections, right? It's not just about preferences. It's partly about did I, you know, uh, prefer, you know, Donald Trump's policy choices to uh, Hillary Clinton's and what that's going to be based on my values. Right. But there are also statements of fact that go into this, right? Like the Democrat Party either is you know, a, uh, a, a an, a, an organization that basically encompasses a wide uh, sex trafficking uh, ring or not, right? And, and these factual questions go into people's uh, judgments. There are beliefs about what policies will do and what policies people even have. So, um, We've done simulations too in the in the kind of context of, of voting. And there you can, there are analogs of this things like the diversity prediction theorem uh, that are voter theorems that also basically show up the same three quantities, right? The the, the individual accuracy, the the accuracy of the majority vote, and the dependence uh between things. And there you can then also look at see context where you know, communication is or is not going to be beneficial with respect to making that group uh, more accurate. I, I don't have much to add. I, I think those are really, really interesting points. Uh, Ulrike, I really enjoyed the talk. Um, to me, uh, as, as Rob uh, observed uh, in the chat, uh, this work does not even assume that there are bad actors in the system that are trying to manipulate it. Uh, so that that also changes because even if you have an algorithm that would work among a set of bias and misinformed but uh, good faith actors, that might not work once might, might not be robust to manipulation. Uh, so that's a, an, an additional component. Uh, another point that uh, only tangentially related to the question that uh, made that presentation just made me think about is that so uh, assuming we have a very diverse um, uh, set of opinions or beliefs uh, as we do, even if they're polarized, right? But we are in different groups. The groups are very different from each other, so the distribution is actually broad. Um, and so in that, the experiment predicts that in that case, you would want to go with, um, you know, with the mean. And the, the algorithms that we have do the opposite. They recommend that you follow people who are similar to you. And in fact, platforms even specifically tell you, like, let's say that you want to report a bad actor online to Facebook or Twitter. If, if any of you has, have done it, like people who put hate messages or misinformation, the first thing that you will see is they say, you, you should unfollow this person or you should block this person. And then if you really insist and tap five other buttons, then they'll say, okay, we'll send it to the moderator and who knows, maybe somebody will see it or not. But the first recommendation is like, just disconnect yourself, which is an encouragement to change the network to make it more polarized. Um, so, the recommendation is the opposite of what Ulrich's uh, experiment uh, suggests would be the right thing to do. Uh, so that makes me worry. Um, and unfortunately, there, there's, there's also experiments that show that if you do recommend to people to follow people who are very different from you, uh, people don't like that. And, uh, and then people actually tend to disengage 
uh, which is why platforms, which is probably why platforms don't do that, because of course they're trying to maximize engagement and uh, advertising revenues. So they won't do something, even if they think is a good idea, they won't do it if it, it will cause them to lose a lot of money. So it is really a tough, uh, a tough challenge. How to, how to find things that might work, but also might not mean that the platform loses a lot of money because if they do, it'll never happen. Yeah, so, so, so a couple of thoughts on that. I mean, uh, and, and the, 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 the kind of potential scope of this work, right? I, I, I think actually that probably a lot of the uh, fixing of, of what we have at the moment is just going to involve shutting some of these things down, to be honest, but, but um, the, there's a, these questions remain interesting outside just extant online social media, right? So, so linking, if any of you heard Steve Lewandowski's talk a few weeks back, Steve and I have been sort of engaged in this kind of sciences collective intelligence kind of projects. And, and one of the things I've put a lot of time and effort into with Steve over the last two years over the course of, pan, of the pandemic is thinking about what kinds of alternative uh, online social deliberation tools we would need, we would want to build for science discourse. So the pandemic basically saw science move to Twitter. Twitter isn't really designed for that. Has There's all kinds of deep and intricate and interesting connections about you know, what a platform affords, even just in terms of expression and how discourse develops there. Um, so I think there's a real question about what kinds of things could we have where we as scientists could deliberate in a transparent and dynamically responsive way uh, in a platform that we had ownership over. And of course, in that context where we own the platform, you can ask all of these questions in a, in a, in a very different uh, in a very different way. And so so part of this, I think is is aimed or motivated for me by by an kind of an even broader vision, which is, you know, replacement uh, social media tools or replacement social media tools, also for very specific deliberation contexts that might actually be quite small, right? Where we sort of think about getting a bunch of experts, um, like a, a government advisory committee, for example, to deliberate in particular ways. We can think about methods, whether or not it's Delphi or, 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 or everybody sees everything. We can think about how to structure those in ways, too, that will, will promote kind of accuracy. I think with respect to online uh, social media, I think the stuff that you were doing is, is probably going to be uh, way more impactful, right? I mean, the one thing that... Um, uh, platforms do have an interest in, at least to a certain extent, is 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 shutting down kind of inauthentic, uh, manipulative content. And I think to the extent that we can find criteria for weeding that out, of course, then you're also moving the entire platform more into the space of the kinds of thing I'm sort of thinking about. But but I think probably just getting rid of the 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 trying to get rid of the uh, obvious bad faith actors and, and and manipulation attempts will will already have a, a, a bigger impact um, than the kind of stuff I'm doing. Excellent discussion. Uh, I would want to invite anyone who has any thoughts. Uh, I see a lot of comments in the chat over, uh, over these two talks. So if anyone just wants to jump in with their comment, feel free to do so. Hi, this is Gabriella. So I think I have one for Phil more so and then one for Ulrika. Um, I'll start with Ulrika since she just gave us that really good talk as well. When you have groups who seem to be more confident about whatever it is, regardless of their knowledge, like if it's something completely arbitrary to them, like with your example with data on Sweden, but their confidence just seems high. And so they they make these decisions with this high degree of confidence in mind, then that can skew what others choose based on what they're being fed as what their choices are. So how do you account for that 
lack of or false confidence in situations like this where people are just, because we see this on social media a lot where people feel like they are 100% confident that they know the answer, even though they've never been exposed to the information. And then that skews the choices of people around them and in their circle. And, you know, they, they have a chance of being right and they have a better chance of not being right. And so what happens when this phenomenon arises? Yeah, so so actually that's that's a really interesting question and and related to these the things I've been talking about in in multiple different ways. So one of them is that we have been doing kind of work on uh, the extent to which communication in a social network itself will give rise to overconfidence, right? Because uh, in a social network you don't really know like information reaches you via multiple paths potentially. So Phil might be saying something, and I get that information sort of implicitly in what other people say uh, by three different uh, paths, but it was always only Phil, right? So just imagine a simple everyday context where Phil says there's a bear. And now I hear three people telling me there's a bear, um, but in fact, they're all kind of dependent on, on, on Phil's. So uh, the dependency structure uh, because it's not known and cat isn't knowable really and even if you know it isn't computationally tractable in in kind of social networks itself will quite likely breed overconfidence if we can measure that uh, relative to sort of calibration the other thing is that that overconfidence uh itself will have multiple negative impacts because the it it might well, and data there are, are, are kind of messy, um, but if you think about the kind of update rule, right, that, that I sort of quickly flashed by where you're always taking some, you see other people's opinions, you're now integrating those with yours, that's gonna be some combination of your own view, what you previously thought, and this new information. And uh, it seems intuitively plausible, and there's at least some data to suggest this, but also data in experimental contexts where confidence doesn't do a lot, that of course, the more confident that I am, the more strongly I'm going to weight my own opinion uh, relative to the, the, the views of others, which means that by one mechanism or the other, which means that it's, it's going to be harder to kind of shift my, my beliefs at all. So it, it seems very likely to me that social networks in and of themselves have these kind of unfortunate feedback loops uh, and, 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 and cycles, which are part of why, I think you can also show this, which are part of why you get polarization. Even if you didn't have the, the kind of affiliative sorting that Phil was mentioning. So even if you didn't allow people to connect or disconnect from others, simply uh, the, the sort of interplay between how confident you are in your belief, the, the reliability you assign to others, right? And the kind of the, the dependency structure itself, I think will make it quite likely that both people are overconfident and overconfident and polarized so that they, they'll wander off in, in, in kind of opposing uh, directions. Uh, and we have simulations to that effect. So yes, uh, overconfidence is bad. It leads to bad decisions. Thank you. And I can wait to ask another question if someone else has one. Can, can I follow up on uh, Ulrich's, just very briefly on, the, on those topics? Thank you, Gabriella. Uh, so I, I second everything. And I, I, I would say that also in our model of emerging polarization, if you turn off the rewiring, just like Ulrike said, you still have emergence of, of polarization. It's just that the network doesn't get segregated because the, net, the structure is not changing. But as soon as, whenever you have any algorithm, like in our case is bounded confidence, which kind of captures these, uh, uh, you know, the fact that you're more likely to change your opinion towards somebody who's somewhat similar to you, whereas not somebody very similar. It's it's a well-known uh, bias. Uh, uh, confirmation confirmation bias is a type of that. Uh, so as soon as you have that, um, uh, you you are quickly accelerating the 
the, the, the politicization of opinion. So, so I agree that uh, that happens. And another point, if I may add, why confidence is bad. We find, this is new work, it's not published yet, um, but we did some studies on, uh, for example, on people's assessment of other social media accounts, specifically whether they are authentic or not. And the more people are highly confident that they can tell, uh, the, the worse judges they are. Uh, <laughs> there is a clear correlation between uh, a, a negative correlation between accuracy and self-perception of accuracy. This is also a well-known effect I know uh, in, in many domains, but it also applies to one's um, assessment of reliability uh, of, of accounts on, on Twitter, for example. So yet another more reason why um, high self-confidence tends to not be particularly good. Thank you for that, Phil. Can I, go ahead, Rob. Oh, no, you, oh, okay. Well, you sort of have a follow-up to something that Phil is just saying. Um, and it's related to like, if you have a super conservative uncle that you're trying to change their opinion of. <laughs> so their opinions way over here to the right. Um, what you just said suggested to me that you should, maybe if you want to change your opinion, it, you should position your position in more here than over here. Um, when we've done experiments just like the ones that Ulrika was talking about, we sort of find that and sort of don't. We find that you're more likely to cause some change to the uncle's opinion when you position yourself here. They'll move a little bit, but um, that total amount of movement won't be very much because a good way of saying how much movement you get is a percentage of the distance between where their position is and where yours are. So if you're interested in like a bigger move, you'd actually position yourself here, understanding that sometimes they won't move at all. Right, uh, right, yeah. Good point, yeah, absolutely. But what we know from, uh, you know, fact from studies of fact checking and and exposure to and recommendation algorithms that recommend diverse sources is that uh, there's a very strong bound of confidence. So yeah, if 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 the distance is big enough, then there's no change at all, as as you just said. Um, so yeah, it's a quandary. <laughs> Sorry, Gabby. My, my second question was for you. And we talked about, well, we listened to you talk about the, the bad actors using bots and how they can manipulate the search algorithms or the algorithms that track engagement. But I'm curious to know if you looked at the algorithms themselves that can be used as bad actors, because sometimes the way the algorithm is designed outside of the actual platform. So not the algorithms that are built into Twitter or Reddit or Facebook, but algorithms that these bad actors are employing to deploy their bots and things of that nature, how the algorithms themselves can be manipulative within the platform. Oh yeah, for sure. So yeah, if, if I'm a bad, a bad actor, I have a lot of tools at my disposal right now. Uh, I can use algorithms to create fake accounts with realistic fake pictures very easily. Uh, so for example, that they won't be noticed that it's, a, you know, I, I could impersonate Rob and steal his photo, but that's easier to detect than if I create a non-existing person at all that doesn't look like anyone else. Um, and that it's hard to notice that it's a synthetic one. Uh, similarly, I can train a, uh, a, a, net, a model to generate text. And in fact, I can train it with text from some source uh, that is uh, pushing my kind of messages. And I can generate an unlimited amount of content that is uh, aligned with, with, with the opinions and the biases uh, of those sources. So we see that we see that uh, algorithms for tech, for language generation are becoming incredibly, uh, incredibly good at generating text that you cannot tell that it was generated by a machine rather than a human. So these are like deep fakes, but uh, you don't even have to go as far as generating a fake video. You can just uh, generate some fake images and some fake text, and now 
uh, you can uh, basically support an army of inauthentic accounts that um, are very hard to detect. Um, so, you know, for example, they don't all have to generate exactly the same text or very small changes, which can be detected by an algorithm like ours. So, you know, that, that means that they can go on notice for a long, longer time. So unfortunately, technology uh, provides these tools. We don't know yet. We have no clue actually as to the extent to which such algorithms are used by bad actors. There's been a lot of alarmism, especially about deep fakes and videos. We, we, we've seen some of them, but, uh, and we've even seen some of them used by bad actors, but not really with big impact, but more subtle things. Um, recently, somebody, I think it was Renee DiRest at Stanford published a, an op-ed in which she was talking about finding a, a, a very large number of fake accounts on LinkedIn. Uh, they, were, they were all use synthetically generated images. Um, so a lot of these might exist and we may not have noticed them yet. Uh, uh, so so there, there is reason to be worried about the role of algorithms um, that could have good applications, but could also have bad applications. Of course, all technology is always uh, neutral from that standpoint. You can use it to doing good things and bad things. So yeah. Um, a good concern. Thank you. Excellent. Uh, thank you again, Phil and Ulrike, for this really amazing, really amazing talks about really fascinating work. And I just wanted to wrap up by inviting everyone for uh, our next meeting, where Natalie Sebans and David Danks will be presenting on uh, joint action and uh, AI ethics. So please. Um, join us next week thank you so much thank you for having us yeah, that, those were great